Functions part two and functions part two now. So, predominantly, we were looking at functions and relations to what you would get it at the C sec level. So, everything this will talk about functions that was predominantly for the C sec level. Now, we're going to talk about functions that you would predominantly get if you were doing functions at C sec ad math level or K math level. And so before we can start, there are some terminologies that we have to get used to. And the first one is an open interval. An open interval is an interval that don't have any endpoints, no definite endpoints. For example, I say written, it's written as parentheses bracket negative three to negative two are used for open ends. And the solution set would mean that X is between negative three and two. So usually, this can be expressed on a number line. So you draw a line like this, right? And there is no endpoint. So negative 3 and 2, right? And from primary school, you draw a circle on top of the 2, draw a circle on top of the 3, and then connect them with a line, right? And you do... And Notice the inside of the circle, I don't share it because I'm showing that it is open. So the solution of X is anywhere between negative three and two, right? It could be negative 2.9999999. It could be 1.7, it could be 1.5, it could be 1.3, it could be 1.1, it could be 0 0.9, it could be any of that stuff, right? I will say that this is known as the open interval, right? So that's open interval. Now, closed interval is an interval that actually have endpoints. So closed interval have endpoints. So for example, for example, it says written as the closed bracket, negative three to two are used for, or right here, they should say closed ends. Let me cross this out. All right, closed ends. It should be closed ends. All right. And so what does that mean for closed ends? So if you were to draw this on a number line, so again, we'll draw a line and we would write three, well, negative three and two. And so you draw a circle over the two, and you draw a circle over the negative three, and you shade it. So some people full, full, fully shade it like color everywhere in it. So you fully shade it, right? And you shade the circle. What the, sh the, sh the shade mean that it actually have an end point, and so negative three and two is included inside of the solution set. And so hence, that's why the inequality is written this way. This is known as closed interval because the interval ends is a part of the solution. That's why it's considered closed. So it is closed whenever the solution, whenever the interval end is a part of the solution, we consider it to be closed. Now, the next one we want to look at is half open is an interval that contains one end but not the other so these are used for half open this right here should have half open not just open so this is used for half open intervals half open intervals right and so first thing again you draw a number line right and then you put the mark negative three and two. But then observe which end is closed. The end with the two is closed. So you put a circle on two and you shade it because that end is closed. And the other end over here is open. 
they can connect the two. And so this is known as half open interval. Right? There's a what if what if I give you this one? What if I give you negative three comma two? What if I give you that now? What would you do? Well again this is still half open. Well this is closed. Sorry. Fix this one. Negative three. So what if I give you this? If I give you this then the solution set, I'm going to call it SS, would be represented by X is such that negative 3 is a part of the solution. So it's less than or equal to X, but X is definitely less than 2. That would be the solution set for this one. And so what you go ahead and do is you draw your number line. And say so I have negative 3 and 2. So we have negative 3, 2. And then we draw circles over negative 3 and 2. So we draw a circle over negative 3 and 2. And then what we do is shade 2. So right here, so we shade 2. And right here, so now, that's open, so we'll leave it. Well, negative 3 is the part that we shape. Right here. Because negative 3 is the part that is closed. And it will connect it with a line. And that's half open. So optimistic persons call it half open. But pessimistic person will call it half closed, right? So if you hear somebody say half open interval, and you hear somebody else say half closed interval, you're talking about the same thing, right? It's always a big debate about whether you have a full cup, not full cup, you have a half cup, and you say either it's half full or it's half empty. Depends on your mindset, right? But for our purposes, we'll stick with half open. We don't want to use the half closed, right? Half open. All right. So now I want you to consider some scenarios, right? So let's set A. So I'm giving you some functions now. So let's set A be a set such that set A is equal to A, B, C, D, and it maps onto some set B, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, such that the relation of F is given by F. It maps set A onto set B. All right. Now, now, there are some definitions that we have to know when we're dealing with functions. Now, and the first one is domain. So we talked about this already. Right? We said that the domain is a set of the X values. Now, we're going to define domain as the set of elements for the input values. So the domain is a set of input values of x. So the input values that are usually x, right? But what if we're not using x, right? So don't get used to just saying x values. These are now the set of input values. That's the domain. And so the input values in this case would be every element in set A. So set A is the domain. Now set B now is what is known as the codomain. And the codomain are the elements from which we can get a possible answer from. What does that mean is we get the result of what we map set A onto set B, right? So the corresponding value for each domain is known as the codomain, are the possible values that we can get to map, to be mapped onto is known as the codomain. So the codomain, it contains the elements from which the output values for the relation can be taken. Now the range, the range is the actual values that are output values. And that's the range. All right? So a lot of information to know, but it's easy. Codomain is a set from which you can take your output values. The range is the actual output values there. Easy. All right? Nice. So let's go ahead. 
and look at some examples. So look at this example now. Consider a mapping such that it maps F1, so F1 is a function, and it maps set A to set B. And F1 is such that we see that the domain consists of four elements, A, B, C, D. And the codomain consists of five elements, one, two, three, four, five. So F1 is not a function, and F1 is not a function because what's the definition of a function? Each element in the domain must map, but B don't map. B does not map. Look at it right here. B don't map. B don't map. So because B don't map, on the three element map, and so because B don't map, it is not a function because each element in the domain must map to an element in the codomain. All right? Now, also, the range is going to be one, two, three. So the range for this relation, since we figure out that it's not a function, the range for this relation is one, two, three. All right? So the range for this relation is one, two, three, because those are the actual output values, but the codomain is one, two, three, four, five. All right? So this is one typical example. Don't worry, we're going to look at a lot of examples so we we'll master this. Example two. So we have F2 now. F2 is such that, again, we have A, B, C, D in set A, and it's being mapped to set B, the codomain set, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now A maps to 1 and 2, B maps to 3, C maps to 3, and D maps to 4. Now, what is the definition of a function? Each element must map and map only once, but clearly A map twice. So F is not a function. So see there, F2 is not a function because the element A in the domain maps to two elements in the range. So it's a one-to-many relation. Now, what if I ask you what is the range of F2? If I ask you for the range of F2, you could tell me that the range of F2 is equal to, so the range of F2 would be equal to, one, two, three, four. That would be the range. But the codomain is one, two, three, four, five. So the range is one, two, three, four. That's the range. But the codomain would be one, two, three, four, five. All right? Codomain is one, two, three, four, five. All right? Don't worry about my spelling. It's a little off sometimes. So codomain, one, two, three, four, five. All the possible output values is the codomain. And the range is the actual output values that were taken. All right? Nice. Now look at this now. Consider this now. So I give we a relation, and this is a one-to-many relation which cannot be a function. Oh, so I actually wrote it down. So this, this top part is for around here. So again, for, this should have been for F2. So this is a one-to-many relation, which cannot be a function. The range is 1, 2, 3, 4, and the codomain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's what I just wrote down around here, which is the same thing for right. Which is the same thing for right here. All right, so let me draw a line just to not get them confused. This part at the top is for around the next page that I just write down. All right, now the next thing we need to look at is a, what's a one-to-one -one function. A one-to-one -one function now, so here's an example. The mapping shown here is for a relation F3 that maps set A to set B. Now the domain of A is A, B, C, D, and the codomain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But A maps to 1, B maps to 3, C maps to 4, D maps to 5. And so the range in this case is 1, 3, 4, 5. Clearly, as element 2, not no map to 2 in the codomain, but the codomain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right, so the codomain is one, two, three, four, five, but the range is one, three, four, five. All right, 
So the range is the actual home book values. Again, the range is the actual home book values. So the range is one, three, four, five. So the range is the actual output values. The range is the actual output values. The range is the actual output values. I say it so many times because people always mistake range and codomain. Range is the actual output values. One, three, four, five. And the codomain is all the elements, all the possible elements that we can take the output from. So again, the codomain in this case is one, two, three, four, and of course, five. That is the codomain. Now, after we look at the codomain and the range, look at this now. So we have the domain, right? And we have the codomain. Nice. All right, so we have the codomain and the domain. Now, one thing I want you to notice with this is that it, we said that it is one-to-one. -one. Now, a new name for one-to-one -one function is injective. So you're going to see this word a lot of time. A function is injective when it is one-to-one. -one. And a one-to-one -one function, what it simply means, well, we looked at one-to-one -one relation, right? I would say that that is a function. One-to-one -one function is just when each element in the domain map to one and only one element in the range. And that's a one-to-one -one function. So each element in the domain map to something different in the code domain. So in this case, A maps to one, B maps to three, C maps to four, D maps to five. Notice that no element in the domain no map to, none of them no map to the same thing in the code domain. So say it is one-to-one, -one, right? One-to-one -one function, just like this. If you have four boys and you have four girls, and the four of the boys then dating four different girls, then what you say? They're in one-to-one -one relationship, right? Which is a proper relationship, all right? So that is one-to-one. -one. That's just an example of one-to-one. -one. No sharing, no sharing, all right? Now, the next word that you're going to have to get familiar with is surjective or surjectivity. So F3 is not surjective. Because the element two in the codomain is not the image of any element in the domain. A function, listen to me carefully, a function is surjective. And what surjective means is that the codomain is equal to the range. So whenever the range of a function is equal to the codomain, then and only then we say that the function is surjective. Another word you say is unto. Unto means surjective. So whenever the codomain and the range is the exact same thing, we say that the function is unto. So this example, the function is not unto because two, not no map to two. All right? Not no map to two. So that's it. Now here's F4. So it said a mapping diagram shows a relation F4 and F4 maps set A to set B. All right? Now set F4 is going to be many to one. And why is it many to one? Because look for an element B. Element B maps the four and element B maps the four. So we have two elements, which is many. More than one is many. So we have two elements in the domain mapped to only one element in the range. So that's many to one. Many to one is a function. Many to one is a function, all right? So many to one relation is a function. So this is a function, but it's a many to one function because B and D maps the four. Now the codomain is going to be equal to one, three, and four. That's the, that's the range, my bad. My bad, that's the range. So the range is one, three, four. So the range is one, three, four because I'm not no map to two and not no map to five. But the codomain is still going to be one, two, three, four, five. All right, the codomain is one, two, three, four, five. The codomain is one, two, three, four, five. All right, the codomain is one, two, three, four, five. See how much time I say? Because people always mistake the codomain and the range. The range is the actual output values. The codomain is all the possible output values that we can take from. All right, let's look at F5 now. 
consider F5 situation. So we have a relation defined by F5 and it maps. Set A map to C. So this should be C, not B. Right, so set A maps to C is an example of a many-to-one surjective function. So surjective functions mean that the codomain equal to the range. So let's see. A map to 1, B map to 3, C map to 3, and B map to 2. Now since both B and C map to 3, B and C map to 3, we have two elements, which is many in the domain, maps to one element in the codomain. And so therefore, it is many to one. But it is surjective because one, two, three is the range and one, two, three is the codomain. So this is a many to one and surjective function. The next one now is bijective function. What is a bijective function? A bijective function is simply a function that is both injective and surjective. So it's a one-to-one -one function and it is unto. And then we call it a bijective function. So here is F6 and F6 is bijective, right? Because it is one-to-one, -one, because each element in the domain map to one thing in the codomain. So A map to one, B map to three, C map to two, and D map to four. Now notice that the codomain is one, two, three, four and the range is one, two, three, four. So again, right here, we can clearly see that the range is equal to one, two, three, four, and the codomain is equal to one, two, three, four. And so what we therefore say is that F6 is, F6 is said to be surjective, and F6 is also injective. And since it's injective and surjective, a new word for that is bijective. So, F, so F6 is bijective. F6 is bijective. This is a bijective function. Easy stuff. All right, now look at the end part. It says, it's a very important thing here. It says F6 has an inverse. So a function only have an inverse when it is surjective and injective. That's the only time a function have an inverse. And may I go tell you why? Where the inverse do the inverse maps the inverse maps the the inverse remember maps the range back onto the domain where the function maps the domain onto the range. So Think about it, the inverse of F6 would mean that one is being mapped to A, two is being mapped to C, three is being mapped to B, and four is being mapped to D. The only way we can flip it around, right, is if it one it fit one to one and if it's surjective. Because look for an example right here where it's many to one. If we flip this back around, right, one is being mapped onto A. 2 is being mapped onto D, 3 is being mapped onto B, and 3 is being mapped onto C. But then remember, I map the range back onto the domain, the inverse. But we can't map 3 to both B and C because this then becomes the domain of the inverse function. And there's no way you can have two things in the domain mapping onto one thing in the range, right? You see that? And so therefore, we can clearly see that once a function is many to one, then the inverse is going to be one to many. Inverse is going to be one to many. And so therefore, the only function that can have an inverse is a one to one function. All right? The only function that can have an inverse is a one to one function that is surjective. So that is a bijective function. Now, here's how we determine if a function is injective. So a function is said to be injective if, if we can solve f of a equal to f of b, and we get a equal b, then we'll say that the function is injective. That's how we would determine if a function is injective, right, mathematically, because that's how you would work it out. Because and every time you go on and put it on a mapping diagram and show, say, each element in the domain map, angle map to one thing in a codomain. 
that you don't want to have to do the mapping diagram all of the time. So you want to do it by calculation. Showing one-to-one -one by calculation, you just solve f of a equal f of b. And if you solve f of a equal f of b, and you get a equal b, then the function is injective. Now, graphically, how do you show that a function is one-to-one? -to, -one? to show that a function is one-to-one, -one, you use a horizontal line test. If the horizontal line passes through only one point at any particular time, then the function is one-to-one. -one. So right here, this is my horizontal line I just insert. And the horizontal line at any point is only going to pass through one point. And so this is a one-to-one -one function. One-to-one -one function. This is a one-to-one -one function. Now look at this now. Example two. Using the horizontal line test, I draw my horizontal line. Now right here, it's a one-to-one -one function. But if I move down to right here, I notice that I have more than one point of intersection of the graph and the horizontal line. Whenever there are more than one point of intersection for the horizontal line, then it's a not, then it's not one to one. So this one is not one to one. So here's an example. It says f of x is equal to three x minus one over two x plus one. Determine if f of x is one to one. So to determine if f of x is one to one, we're going to solve f of a equal to f of b. And if we get a equal b, then it is one to one. So we're solving f of a equal to f of b. To solve f of a equal f of b, we substitute a and b in the function. So this becomes three a minus one divided by, this looks like two a plus one, and that's equal to three b minus one divided by two b plus one. So this is what we're solving. So this implies I can carry over this to get three a minus one times two b plus one. Three a times two b plus one, and that's equal to this is equal to 3b minus 1, 3b minus 1 times 3b minus 1 times 2a plus 1, 2a plus 1. This is what we're solving now. So I want to finish it right here. I don't want to go to a new page. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take off the top right here. Just make some space. So we're continuing this question up the top. Continuing this question up the top. So continuing right here, what we're seeing then is that if we expand this side right here, right, what we're solving then is 3a, 3a times 2b, 3a times 2b is going to be that's going to be 6ab, then 3a times 1 is going to be plus 3a, and then 2b times minus 1 is minus 2b, and then minus 1 times 1 is minus 1, and that's equal to 6 a, B, because again, I'm getting 3B times 2A is 6AB. Then I'm getting minus, well, plus 3B, plus 3B, minus 2A. I'm just expanding the bracket. And then minus 1 times minus 1 is minus 1. So to equate them now, we want to put A's them on one side and the B's them on one side to see if A are equal B. So right here, so now look on it. 6AB over here so, and 6AB over here. So if we subtract 6AB from both sides, then AB are going to cancel. So 6AB are going to cancel 6AB from this side, right? 
Or can you think about it this way? If I have 5 plus x equal to 3 minus x. Well, let's use 5 minus x. Right? What I'm saying is if you subtract 5 from both sides, then you're going to get 0. So that's what I did right here. I just subtract 6ab from both sides. And so it becomes zero. So subtracting 6ab from both sides, that becomes zero. So what we're left with now is minus one is going to cancel the minus one as well. And so what we're left with is 3a minus 2b is equal to 3b minus 2a. And so bring over the a's on this side. So I get plus 2a to both sides become 5a, plus 2b to both sides become 5b, and so 5a equal 5b, that implies that a is equal to b. Since a is equal to b, f is 1 to 1. So you can write f is 1 to 1. So I'm going to take out the graphs because I don't want it to confuse with the calculation, the horizontal line test. If they give you a graph, you use horizontal line test. But here it is now, f is one to one. f is one to one. f is one to one since a equal to b. Now the next thing we want to talk about is how do we test for surjectivity, right? A function is surjective when each element in the codomain is an image of at least one element in the domain. So how to test for surjectivity is to see that if every element in the domain gives a correspond, if every element in the domain, there is an image for that element. So the codomain must be equal to the range. Graphically, what does that mean is, let's say this is, this is some function, right? This is some function and this is the domain. Let's say this is the domain. This is the domain. If this is the domain, this is the domain, then all of this, all, for all the domain, look, when x is this value, we get a range, a y value right here. When x is this value, we get a y value right here. x is this value, we get a y value right here. All of these y values are the range. But then all of this is also the codomain. All of this is the codomain. So when the codomain equal to the range, we say that codomain, this says codomain, but it really should be codomain. When the codomain is equal to the range, then we say that the function is surjective. Now a horizontal line test can be used to determine if a function is surjective. How does that work? If, if a horizontal line is used and it detect, let's say it detect a portion on the graph where there, is, where there is no function, it don't detect nothing, then it is not surjective. But if a horizontal line always detect a point, then it is surjective. All right, so this, is, this function would be surjective. Well, let's say, for example, this is the graph. This is the graph, and this is the codomain. So I'm going to use C for codomain. All of this represents C. But however, notice that the range is just from here to here. So from here to here is the range. So I'm right R. So if we do a horizontal line test, Right, you know what he's saying, I detect no point right here, so no point on the graph is detect detected. And so by the horizontal line test, we would say that the function is a not surjective, not. So let's look at an example. So solving by calculation surjectivity. So you're gonna solve if f of a equal to b, and a is a domain of f, then for any value of b, b must also be a codomain of f. 
So you solve f of a equal to b for surge activity. Example, let's say f of x is 2x minus 3, and x is an element of integer. So solving f of a equal to b, so let me write it down. I know right here I'm skipping out steps, and so sometimes it's hard to follow. So I give you the function f of x is 2x minus 3, where x is an integer. f of x is 2x minus 3, and x is an integer. x is an element of integer. And so what we have right now is f of a equal to b. So f of a is equal to f of a is equal to 2 times a minus 3 and f of a is equal to b. This is our test for injectivity. f of a equal to b. Now b is what? a is a part of the domain and b should also be a codomain. So a and b should both be integers. Remember a and b should both be elements of integer right so what i'm saying now is let's say you were to try the codomain so you're going to give b some value if you try let's say b equal to two if we try b equal to two what we get is two a minus three so we're trying values of b that are integers of course so try b being equal to two where b is an element of integer, where 2 is an element of integer. So 2a minus 3 equal 2. So bring over the minus 3 to get 2a is equal to, carry over the minus 3, we get 5. And so when we solve 2a equal 5, we get a is equal to 2.5. But 2.5 is not a L integer, 2.5 is not an integer. And so clearly, for some value, when B is 2 in the codomain, it has no corresponding value of A, which is in the domain. And so therefore, this function is not surjective. And so hence, we can conclude that F is not surjective. All right? Because what this means is, if we were to draw the mapping diagram, trying to make us understand better with this mapping diagram. So I were to draw the mapping diagram. This is the codomain. This is a domain, x. And this is the codomain, f of x, right? I am saying the codomain is x is an element of z. So that means we'll have 0, negative 1, negative 2, all the way up to negative, close to negative infinity. Then we have 1, 2, all the way down. What I'm saying is for all, remember now, x is an element of integer, right? I am saying, therefore, that for all the x values that we have, from we have x values 0, 1, 2, and continue, x is an element of integer, and all of these values too, there is nothing that is going to map to 2, because look what it says. When b is 2, we we'll get that. The number that mapped to 2 is 2.5. But there's no 2.5 right here. There's no 2.5 in the domain set. And so nothing don't map to 2. If nothing don't map to 2, then 2 is not the image of no function. 2 is not the image of no element, rather, inside the domain x. Right? And so clearly, what we can then state is that f is not surjective. Also, we try b as 0. When b is 0, we notice that there is nothing mapping to 0 as well from domain. And so therefore, the function is not surjective. So we can take surjectivity by looking at the mapping diagram to see if the codomain equal the range. Or we can use a horizontal line test. Or we can use calculation and solve f of a equal to b to find a value of b in the codomain where we get some x value that maps that onto the codomain value of b. All right, so those are how we test for surjectivity. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is quadratic functions. 
All right. So as we were saying, we're looking at the domain now of a quadratic function. So property quadratic functions rather have unique properties. So for example, the properties of a quadratic function, I can fully show you what is happening with the example. So consider this. Let's say I give you a quadratic function and f of x is x minus one. <coughs> f of x is x minus one all square. And x is an element of real numbers. So find the properties. So what are the properties of f? So f of x is x minus one all square. Now f of x is x minus one all square. That's a quadratic function that looks something like this. And it's a x is an element of real. So this is this is a graph. So say so this is f of x, right? This is f of x and f of x is x minus one all square. So if you were to sketch the graph, right, it's a quadratic graph that's going to turn right here. So this is f of x equal to x minus one all square. So this is f of x or y, which is equal to x minus one all square. This is how the graph look, right? How do I know that it's already so remember when you did quadratics from CSEC, you'd have learned about writing it in its vertex form when you complete the square and the turning point would be one zero, right? According to that form, the turning point is one zero, right? X is one and Y is zero. So this is the turning point and this is Y equal to X minus one R square. So if Y is equal to X minus one R square, this is our function and it is many to one. Because if you're to draw a horizontal line, so if you're to use a horizontal line test, right? A horizontal line test, once it detects two more than one point, it is not one to one, but many to one. So right here, we detect two points of intersection with our horizontal line test, horizontal line test. And so clearly it is many to one. This is a many to one function, right? Because a number like, x being, when x is like five, you get four minus one r square is 60. Or when x is a number like, let me see now, minus four, you get minus four minus one, which is five r square, and you still get 25. All right, so you're gonna have more than one element in the domain mapping to the same element in the range, and so it's many to one. Now, a many to one function cannot have an inverse, and we'll discuss why. Because if it's many to one, when you flip it around, right, I map the range back onto the domain, it's going to be one to many, which is not a function. So, many to one cannot have an inverse. Now, the properties of this function is that if you look at it, the function is completely above the x axis, and so the range of the function. This is the range. The range is f of x is greater than zero. That's the range. This is the range right here. f of x is greater than zero. This is the range. So notice that it's not onto because we don't utilize none of these values down here. Right? So this is the range right here. So All right, and so this is what happened with this function. So now I'm going to do some restrictions on these functions, right? And we're gonna observe what is happening. Let's say I were to restrict this function between a particular domain, right? Let's restrict the domain. So let's say f of x is a function and I restrict it between zero and three. So if I were to restrict it between zero and three, right, I'm gonna draw a table right here. If you're wondering why I'm drawing a table, I'm just gonna write down X and Y and put in the corresponding Y values that occur for X. 
right? So x is between zero, so we have zero, one, two, three, and of course x, right? So look what we're going on, pre. So this is x and this is y, so write x, and then f of x. So when x is 0, we're going to get 0 minus 1 all square. And 0 minus 1 all square is what? 0 minus 1 is minus 1, and minus 1 square is 1. Now, when f of x, when x is 1, we get 1 minus 1, which is 0. So when x is 1, f of x is 0. Then, when x is 2, we get 2 minus 1 is 1. So when x is 2, we get 2 minus 1 is 1. Then finally, when x is 3, we get 3 minus 1 is 2, and 2 squared is 4. Right? So when x is 3, we're getting 2 squared minus 1, 2 squared, which is 4. And so f of x, the range of f of x is between 0 and 4. So this is why I write it down, that the range of f of x is between 0 and 4. All right? That's the range. These are the actual output values. The actual output values is between 0 and 4. Now, if I were to sketch this graph, it's still many to 1. Look at why. Because both, both 0 and 2 in the domain is being mapped to 1 in the codomain. So it is many to 1. So because it is many to 1, it has no inverse. So look at this now. So let's sketch the graph now. If you were to sketch the graph, of the new f of x. I remember we're only going up to x is between 0 and 3. So when x is 0, y is 1. So the function looks something like this now. So when x is 0, y is 1. Right here is the point 1. And then all the way up. So when y is 3, when x is 3, that y value is 4. So this is now the function, right? When we restrict it. Now, we are going to stay so now, and we are going to restrict the function some more. So we are going to restrict the function to x being greater than 1. So restricting the function to x being greater than 1. So in our, when we restrict the function to x being greater than 1, I want you to observe what happened. So I'm going to draw a table right here. So when I restrict the function to x being greater than 1, look what happened. So we're going to have x and f of x, I'm just going to write f for f of x. So here it is, f of x. When x is 1, right, the corresponding y value we get is 0. When x is 2, the corresponding y value we get is 1. When x is 3, the corresponding y value we get is 4. But since it's x squared, as we increase in values of x, f of x will also increase, right? Clearly, f of x will also increase. So we're focusing on f of x from x being greater than or equal to 1. So look what happened to f of x now. If I am to draw a sketch of f of x, if I am to draw a sketch of f of x, this is what I have. This is from the point where x equal 1. Then this is the function now of f of x. So, ah, look what happened to f of x now. So this is now y equal to x squared, where x is just greater than or equal to 1. Now, this can have an inverse. Why can it have an inverse? Because we said that a function can have an inverse when it is 1 to 1. And so we can make a quadratic function 1 to 1 by restricting the domain. When we restrict the domain of a quadratic function, it becomes one-to-one, -one, where 
When it becomes one to one, the inverse function is then the square root of x plus one. The range of this function is still x being, this is still the range, which is all the output values. The range is still gonna be f of x being greater than zero. But then what's gonna be the properties of the inverse function, which is f to the minus one? The inverse is also gonna be one to one. And the domain of the inverse is the range of the original function. And the range of the inverse is the domain of the original function. We talked about that from earlier on, right? And so the only way we can get a quadratic function to be one-to-one -one is by restricting the domain of f. So pre work one now. So here we talk about it now. How to, how to get a quadratic curve to be one-to-one. -one. So first, consider a quadratic function ax squared plus bx plus c. That's the standard form. The next thing you have to do is complete the square. Complete the square meaning you're going to write it in in vertex form a minus xtr squared plus yt. This underscore here, so right here that, because I didn't know how to type it, I put the underscore, but what I pretty much mean is to write it in this form a in bracket, x minus xt square plus yt. That is vertex form. Some people used to seeing it as a in bracket, x plus h r square plus k. Right? That's how people used to see it. Where xt, yt is the coordinates of the turning point. Now, the function can have an inverse if and only if we restrict the domain to be x being less than the turning point or x being greater than the turning point. And then we can find the inverse of the quadratic function. So that's the only way we can find the inverse of a quadratic function. So I really want to look at an example. So here's an example. It says f of x. So f of x is x squared minus 4x plus 5. And it says, find the value of k for which f of x has an inverse. And hence, state the domain and the range. So we're going to work out this question together. So let's do this question together. All right, so let f of x be x squared minus 4x plus 5. By completing the square, find the value of k for which f of x has an inverse. So let's complete the square for this function so we can find the inverse. So f of x, we write down about the function, f of x is equal to x squared minus 4x plus 5. That is f of x. f of x is x squared minus 4x plus 5, where x is of course greater than or equal to k. So now to complete the square, there are many ways we can complete the square, right? So remember how you complete the square, you say x. This becomes, now in order to complete the square minus 4x, you half it, say so half it, square, then you subtract back the square of negative 2. plus 5. And so this becomes equal to x minus 2 all square minus the square of negative 2 is 4 and then minus 4 plus 5 is 1. They get plus 1. So this is it completed the square. So we say x minus 2 plus 1. That's one way of completing the square. Another way how you could complete the square, so I'm going to write or, or, a lot of people prefer to do it this way. They write down the formula for it. So in completing the square, it would say something like f of x is equal to x squared minus 4x plus 5, which is equal to a in bracket x minus xt 
square plus y t. This is just how some people complete the square. Then they write where a equal one, a is the coefficient of x square, b equal negative four and c equal five. B equal negative four and C equal five. So what they go further to do is they then state that, all right, XT is equal to minus B over two A. XT is equal to minus B divided by two A, which is equal to minus B, which is minus minus four, which is positive four, divided by two times one, which is two. And so xt equal to 2. And then they go further to say, all right, yt is then equal to f of xt. yt is equal to f of xt. And so yt is equal to f of xt, which is equal to f of 2. And f of 2 is equal to 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times 2, which is negative 4. Neg so I have 4 minus 8, which is negative 4, plus 5, which is 1. And so this function, clearly, after we find xt and yt, we would write f of x is equal to a, a which is 1, bracket, x minus xt, which is x minus 2, all square plus yt, which is plus 1. All right? And so that's f of x. f of x is 1 minus x minus 2 all square plus 1. So that's how some people would do it. But I'm not a fan of this method. I'm sticking with the raw version of completing the square. All right? By factorization. I'm sticking to principles of factorization. So, no formula method. That's for when you were doing CSEC when you were a baby. Now you're doing ADMATH or CAPE. So this is how you do it. All right? So no OR method. Do it by factorization. All right. So then now, this is f of x. So we'll complete the square. Then it says find the value of k for which the function, of, the function has an inverse. So you can write it down. The function has an inverse when x is greater than xt. So you can write, the function has an inverse when x is greater than its turning point, when x is greater or less than its turning point. All right? So that's when the function has an inverse. And so the turning point right here is 1. And so what we can then say is that x must be greater than or equal to 1. And so hence, k equal 1. Hence, k equal 1. Hence, k equal 1 for which the function has an inverse. For f of x have an inverse. K equal 1 for f of x to have a inverse. So after we find the value of k, now it says, hence find f inverse of x. So find f inverse and state its domain and range. So we need to find f inverse. So pre this now, we just said that f of x, we just said that f of x is equal to x minus x minus 2 all square, x minus 2 all square plus 1. So instead of calling it f of x, we're going to call it y. So we know how to find inverse Step one, interchange x and y. So we're going to write x is equal to x minus y as x minus interchange x and y. And so we're going to get 
x is equal to y minus 2, y minus 2, all square plus 1. And so this implies that what we're getting is x minus 1 is equal to y minus 2 all square. And so who are we going to get y when it is being square? We have to square root both sides. So we're going to square root both sides to get the square root of x minus 1 is equal to y minus 2. And so we can add 2 to both sides now. And so continuing up here, we add 2 to both sides. We will get that the square root of x minus 1 plus 2 is equal to y. But this y is f inverse. This y is f inverse. And so we can write f inverse of x. f inverse of x is equal to 2 plus the square root of x minus 1. So that's f inverse of x. Now, pre what the next part of the question say, right? I'm going to put it in a box right here, the solution for that part. I'm going to put it in a box right here. Now, pre what the question say, it say, state the domain and its range of f inverse. So remember, the domain of f inverse, listen to me carefully, the domain of f inverse, the domain of f inverse is equal to the range of f. The domain of f inverse is equal to the range of f. So the domain of f inverse is equal to the range of f. Range of f. And the range of f is equal to, what was the range of this quadratic? The range of this quadratic appears to be x is greater than or equal to 1. So the domain of f inverse, domain of f inverse is the range of f. And so it is when x is going to be greater than or equal to 1. That's the domain of f inverse. Now what is the range of f inverse? The range of f inverse, the range of f inverse is going to be equal to the domain of f. So the range of f inverse equals to the domain of f is equal to the domain of f. Range of f inverse is the domain of f, which is equal to the domain of f. Remember, we said that this is the domain of f. x is greater than or equal to 1. And so the range... The range of f inverse is the domain. Oh, right here, this is... The turning point was 2, so this should have been x greater than or equal to 2. Why did I put 1 there? My apologies. So this is when so k must be 2. Right? This is the turning point. x value at the turning point. So the range of f inverse is the domain of f. The range of f inverse is the domain of f. And so the range of f inverse, which is the domain of f, so the range of f inverse is going to be y is greater than or equal to the domain of f, and the domain of f was greater than or equal to 2. And so the range of f inverse is y is greater than or equal to 2. So that's how you do this question. Easy. Soft. All right? Easy question. All right. Now, here are some additional information, which I highly doubt you'll ever get questions doing it, but it's on the syllabus, so we should talk about it. But they haven't set any question regarding this with functions as yet, but it's on the syllabus. So, first thing is increasing and decreasing. So, a function is increasing in the interval where the gradient is positive 
a function is decreasing where the gradient is negative, and a function is stationary or not moving where the gradient is zero. So for the graph, so I, I'm going to draw the graph now, right? I'm going to draw a graph. I'm just going to draw a random graph. And here's my random graph. This is my random graph, right? And I have some point. This is some point A, and this is some point B. Now look what happened. The function is stationary when x is A and when, when x is B. So if you were to look at this point right here, if you were to find the gradient at this point, the gradient is going to be equal to 0. Remember, how do we find gradient? Gradient is equal to rise over run. That's how we learned it from C, so it rise over run, or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So remember when we did straight lines, when the line looked like this, we said that the gradient is positive. When it's a horizontal line, the gradient is zero. When it's a line that looked like this, the gradient is negative, right? That's what we learned. So likewise, right here now, at this point right here, so it is only rising, but there's no run. And so the gradient at A is 0, the gradient at B is 0. Let's look at when X is less than A. When X is less than A, now we see that it is a positive gradient because there is rise over run. So the rise over the run would be Y2, somewhere right here, minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, and it would be positive. Right here is positive gradient. Right between between A and B now the gradient is what negative. Between A and B the negative gradient is negative, and so the function is decreasing. So think about it. So the function here go, it's increasing. Then it reach here, so it stop. Then it start decrease. Then it reach B. Then what? Wait, do after it reach B, it start increase again. All right, and so that's all increasing and decreasing me. But they don't give us any question with these yet, so it's just for us to know this about functions. We usually get something with increasing gradient in module three when we're doing differentiation, but for now, they don't give us anything in, in, in CSEC AdMath regarding to functions and increasing and decreasing gradient. The next thing we want to talk about is graphing any equations and inequalities. They love to give questions like these, especially at Cape Unit 1. They love to give questions like these. Not so much at ADMA. They haven't done so yet, but it's on the syllabus. So consider the graph of two functions, g of x and f of x, right? Now solving y equal f of x equals g of x, if we solve the equation of the two lines together, we, got, we get their points of intersection. And so the same way, if we solve the equation of the curves together, we get two points of intersection, right? So two points of intersection, in this case, is a and b. If we solve where f of x is less than g of x, f of x is less than g of x, so f of x is this green thing right here. So f of x is less than g of x, Right in here, so I'm going to shade the region. So this is where f of x is less than g of x. f of x is below f of x. Oh, no. I erased off the, erased off the topics. But f of x is less than g of x in here. So f of x is less than g of x. This is f of x. f of x less than g of x means which portion of the graph is f of x below the graph of g of x? f of x is below g of x right in here where we were shading, 
right? This is where f of x is below g of x. Now, what if they ask you where f of x is greater than g of x? f of x is greater than g of x is where this part is above the line, is above the curve g of x, which it is above when x is less than a and when x is greater than b. All right, so that's, those are solution regions. Again, they haven't given us any CSEC ad math questions like that yet, but it's on the syllabus for us to know. All right, now finally, the final topic is simple translation of curve. Simple translation of curve, right? They haven't given any question at CSEC level yet, but they give lots of questions at K. So simple transformation, if they give you y equal f of x, and they ask for the translation f of x plus a, so this is pretty much it. So we have y is f of x, Let's say this is the graph of y of f of x. This is f of x, right? That is f of x. Let me use a nice example. So let me continue. Um, let's say y is f of x plus a. Then this is just meaning that we push the graph of f of x up by a units. Right, so let's say, for example, I have a graph. I have a graph y equal f of x, and let's say f of x is x squared. I use x squared because it's easy to draw. This is y equal x squared. Then what would be f of x plus a? Then y equal f of x plus a, a would be y equal x squared plus a. Now that graph would mean I push the graph up by a unit of positive A. So that would be looking something like this. So this would be the graph of y equal x squared plus A. Now what if I wanted y equal x squared minus A? That would mean I go down y equal x squared minus A. Of course, A would be the point where it passed to the y-axis. So let's say well, I want y equal x squared minus A would be this now. So I push it down on the y-axis by a factor of minus A. All right, so this is y equal x squared. This is equal y equal x squared plus A. This is y equal x squared minus A. Now, there's also translation in the y direction where we have y equal x minus a. And so what that means is that we push the graph in the positive x direction. So this is what we mean, y equal x minus a. Let me take off these. So let's say we start with y equal x squared. So we'll start with y equal x squared. Then the graph of y equal x squared minus a mean we'll push the graph in positive x direction by a. And so this would be the point a. And then this blue graph would be y equal to x minus a all squared. Now if we push the graph in the negative x direction to over here, then this graph over here would be y equal to x plus a all squared. All right. Now, the reflection of the curve y equal f of x by a unit in the x direction, that is y equal minus f of x. y equal minus f of x means reflect the curve over the x-axis. And so let's say we have, let me take off these now, let's say we have y equal x squared. So let's say we have y equal x squared. So y equal x squared and y equal minus x squared mean reflect the graph over the x-axis, 
And so this becomes y equal to minus x squared. So reflect the graph below the x-axis. In this case, this is for y equal minus f of x. All right. The next one to look at is right here is y equal to f inverse of x is a reflection of the curve in the line y equal x. So we looked at inverse already. So I'm not looking at this one because this is inverse. We looked at inverse. Now y equal the modulus of x. Now this is for Kate math. Y equal the modulus of x just means that if we have y e any portion of the graph that is below the x-axis, we reflect it over the x-axis. So that's what modulus means. So for example, if we have a graph like this, then what the modulus function do is this little portion right here will reflect it over the x-axis. So it becomes this instead. This would be y equal f of x. And then this would be y equal the modulus of f of x. But we look at this when we're talking about modulus functions. All right. And then that's pretty much it. We know about multiplying a function by factors already. All right. And then that's pretty much it. So this covers the content for CSEC math and CSEC math functions and relations.